this is our fourth week uh, in this, this book, this relatively small, short book, uh, as we're looking at, uh, at, at this, this whole idea of how God used a reluctant prophet um, to save hundreds of thousands of people, an entire city, uh, who would then come and confess their sin and uh, repent. And we're going to look at this a little bit more today. But um, here's God who does this crazy thing that many of us have probably experienced, and that is he's given uh, his prophet Jonah a call. He's called his prophet to do something that, frankly, his prophet really didn't want to do. Uh, God calls Jonah to warn his Assyrian arch enemies um, in the capital city of Nineveh to repent of their sinful ways or they would be destroyed. So Jonah decides, of course, that, you know, being God himself, apparently, that the Ninevites didn't deserve to be spared. And so instead of going and leaning in toward God's call, he decides to run away from God's call. And so he sails in the other direction. Well, we've already seen in the last few weeks that that in response to his disobedience to God, God didn't just look the other way and say, oh, well, I guess I'll go find somebody else who will say yes. No, God instead, it says, sent a storm as he's in this, this boat sailing in the opposite direction. Um, Jonah was thrown into the sea, and so then God saved him from drowning by, as it says in Scripture, by providing a big fish to swallow him, uh, to give Jonah, if you will, a chance to reconsider his decision. Perhaps he might want to do something different than what he was originally intending to do. And as, we, as Pastor Elisha so well described last week, there was Jonah, right, in the belly of this great fish. And no question about it, he did a lot of thinking. Wouldn't you do a lot of thinking if you were in the belly of a fish? Well, that's exactly what he did. Um, and he reassessed his decision. And uh, you know that he was asking at least once or twice or 10,000 times, what have I gotten myself into? Here I am now. Okay, I better think about what I was planning on doing. Now, here's the thing. One more thing about that whole scenario. Believe it or not, what God did by having a great fish swallow Jonah was an act of his mercy. Not just because it prevented him from drowning, not just because, you know, um, he would have been, you know, floating or, you know, fish food or whatever if, if God hadn't rescued him in that way. But he provided this fish, I believe, to save Jonah from himself. I believe he provided this fish to help Jonah to stop, as it says, right, as, as you've heard, we've all heard probably, you know, to step back from the forest to see the trees or the trees to see the forest or whatever, right, to kind of change his perspective a little bit. God, in his great mercy, put the brakes on Jonah's running from him. And wanted Jonah to stop and to think about the call a little more. God, in his mercy, even today, sends us big fish moments, doesn't he? How many of you have ever been in a big fish moment in your life? You're going in a certain direction, all of a sudden, God, in his incredible mercy, he allows something to happen to just, you know, put the brakes on and hold on, let me just stop, let me think about what's happening. You know, is that something that you've experienced yourself? I think we all have. Well, let me ask you this. What do you do when you're in the belly of the fish? Whatever that experience is, what do you do then? Do you complain? Do you, you know, uh, pound, you know, your fists against the wall or against the table? Are you angry? Do you pitch a fit? Do you complain? Do you do what I do, which is often whining? Just ask my wife, you know. What do you do when you're in the belly of a fish, when you have that experience in your life? Do you cry out to God? Do you say, God, I don't know why this is happening, but please show me what I need to learn from this? I think that's what God wants from all of us. Okay, so at the end of chapter 2, we read that Jonah's fish belly experience had run its course, right? He had already prayed, you know, we, talked, we, we heard about last week how that prayer was a little less than sincere, most likely. Uh, but it's run its course. The Lord commanded the fish to vom vomit Jonah onto dry land, it says. So go ahead, grab your Bibles. We're going to look at jo uh, Jonah chapter 3. We're going to Jonah chapter 3. Uh, again, it's a little small book, uh, pretty close to the middle of the Holy Bible. It's the collection of all 66 books known as the Holy Bible. Um, if you've got the Bibles that we provide here um, in the ministry center, it's on page 917, 
9.17. But Jonah chapter 3, it's only 10 verses, so we're going to read the whole chapter. Oh, my word. If you came to a church service today and you had to read a whole chapter, it's only, it's only a couple paragraphs, though. It's not that big of a deal, so I promise you'll survive. All right, Jonah chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 1. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. All right, then it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it, proclaim to it the message I give you. Verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. That's a change. (laughs) Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. It was a big city to go through the whole city, about three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days in Nineveh will be overturned. There's the key word we heard a few moments ago. Okay, 40 more days in Nineveh will be overturned. Verse 5, look at what happens. The Ninevites denied his message. The Ninevites ignored and mocked Jonah. The Ninevites believed God. These wicked Ninevites believed God, it says. They declared a fast going without food, okay? And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, that's just really scratchy clothing, which is basically mourning. It's, it's, it's basically an indication that I am, in a, I am going through a period of mourning right now, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. Verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, it didn't even reach the king yet. The people had already responded to this message with sincere repentance. When the message or the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Verse 7, then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had what? He had compassion on them, and he did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Talk about the unexpected. What a reaction that was. I can imagine how Jonah must have been feeling. Again, remember, way in the beginning, he ran from God, and you'll see um, probably next, next week or the week after, you'll see how, my goodness, you know, Jonah was afraid that God in his mercy would forgive the Ninevites, because he thought they didn't deserve it, right? But look at how dramatic of a response the Ninevites gave. So here's Jonah. He arrives in Nineveh, finally, after his fish belly experience, okay? And he gives a five-word sermon. Now, I know it's more than that because it was translated into English, but there were actually five words, I believe, in Hebrew. Okay, five words. Five words, which basically means, okay... Nineveh, in 40 more days, Nineveh will be overturned. So in response, they respond in an in astoundingly sincere way. Verse 5, it says, they believed God. They humbled themselves. They declared a fast. They wore sackcloth. They demonstrated sincere humility. They demonstrated sincere sorrow. And by all appearances, a spiritual revival broke out as a response, as a result of all this. I wonder if there's anything we can learn from what happened to the Assyrians in Nineveh. They humbled themselves, and they turned from their wicked ways, and as a result, God heard from heaven. As a result, revival broke out, and an entire city was saved. They embraced true repentance, and as a result of embracing true repentance, they were saved. The entire city was saved. So this morning, I'm going to talk about these two things, the first one being repent. It's what it's about. It's about repent. What does repent mean? Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about this word, and I explained that repent is that if you're going in one direction, you stop the direction that you're going in, 
You do an about face and you go in the opposite direction. That's what repent means. Okay? So it's not just asking for forgiveness. Okay? Yes, that is involved. Okay? You ask for forgiveness, but it's so much deeper than that. Ultimately, it always comes back to relationships. Follow me here. Okay? Repentance, true repentance, always comes back and points back to relationships. Okay? It's about reconciling a relationship with someone that you love that's been strained because you've sinned against that person, or in this case, God. And so you need repentance. You need to stop doing what you're doing. You need to do an about face and go back in the other direction. It's a 180, not a 360. A 360 puts you right back where you were going, okay? So just do a, a, a half turn, okay, and head back. That's what this is all about. Again, let's not confuse repentance with, you know, an apology, there's a big difference. An apology can be sincere, but it, it can also be insincere. Have you ever had an insincere apology? You can tell right off the bat, within seconds, if it's an insincere apology, if they use the word but. I've done it myself. I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. All right. Or I'm sorry, but you started it. Or I'm sorry, but if you weren't so selfish, then... Or if you didn't do this, then I wouldn't have had to... And there's some other, you know, you know, conjunctions or whatever that you could add other than but. Uh, but you get the idea, right? Right? Okay. So true repentance can't be insincere. Ever. True repentance has to be and is always sincere. Because you have to back it up for it to be a legitimate repentance. It has to be backed up with a change in, in action, if you will. The Ninevites repented. It was sincere. And as a result, God relented from what the plan was, okay? Now, I need a, a volunteer, a, uh, someone from the audience who would come up and uh, help me illustrate the difference between repentance and an apology that may not be very sincere. I promise I won't embarrass you, but I do need someone to come up. Who's going to raise their hand? Who's going to get the $100 that's in my left pocket? <laughs> oh, that's not 100 But you, anyway, I need a volunteer. Come on! All right, come on up, Carol. There we go. There's always someone with a little nerve. All right, Carol, my notes are right here, so thanks. All right, good. No, I'm just kidding. You're not preaching. I'm just kidding. Okay, so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of act out uh, someone who's being repentant, and then I'm going to act out someone who is not being repentant, but they're basically, you know, apologizing. Okay. Okay. All right, so I want, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, basically think through, as we're doing this, what, what response that I'm giving you. Say, so I've hurt you somehow, in some way, right? I want you to think through how each response makes you feel, and then I'll just ask you a couple questions about it. Okay. All right? Okay, so I've hurt you, right? You've, you've somehow brought that to my attention, whatever it is, and my first response to what you said is, is this. Okay, I'm sorry. Jeez, Carol. <laughs> How did that make you feel? How did that make you feel? Yeah, you didn't, your, your upper lip kind of curled up. I, I, I'm not thinking that that really hit you very well. Does, no. does that seem like a sincere apology? No. Okay, all right. Okay, so you've come up to me and you've told me that I've hurt you, right? You've hurt me in that apology. <laughs> that apology, <laughs> right? Okay. Here's my other response. Carol, I am so sorry. I did not mean to hurt you. Is there anything that I can do to make it right? Because my, I wasn't thinking, and I want to fix this. That was sincere. Now, if I leave it at that and then just go on like nothing ever happened, it's still an apology, right? If, it, if it's true repentance, then I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that I don't repeat the same thing. I'm going to put effort into it and be aware of that. Now, does that mean that I'm going to be perfect and never hurt you again? No, it doesn't. But the actions that are behind the words are the key. Actions speak louder than words, right? So I have to do something different to make sure that that's important to me or else it's something that I'll just forget and I'll be flippant and you know, not, not sincere about it going forward. So is that good? Helpful. Right. Let's give Carol a round of applause. Woohoo! Thank you. All right. And I'll get you the $100 when I find it. Okay. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, that, that helps a little bit. You know, the difference between the two responses, if you really think about it, repentance, true repentance, and just an apology, really comes down to love. 
when you really think about it. Because if I really love someone and I've hurt them, that hurts me. Because I don't want to hurt the person that I love. And so because of the love I have for that person, I'm going to change my behavior, do whatever it takes to make sure that person never feels that way again. Now again, like I said, we're imperfect human beings, so we may mess up. And that's where grace comes in, which is beautiful. But at the same time, if, if I really love someone, I don't want to hurt that person, so I'm going to try to fix it and do whatever I can to make sure that that same type of a, of a pain or a hurt doesn't repeat itself once again. Now, how do you respond when you sin against God? You know, maybe you're going through your day or whatever, and, and the Holy Spirit reveals to you there's something in the way. There's, there's a sin that's in the way that's keeping you from me, that's separating us. And he reveals that to you. How do you respond? I think many of us kind of push the thought away, push it down, push it aside. I don't want to deal with it because I'm going to feel guilty. And sometimes when God uses other people to bring to our attention that we have sinned, we respond in the same way. We slap them down, we push them away, we run and then we escape because it makes us feel guilty. And, and we live in a world that, you know, frowns and, and looks down at guilt. If someone's guilting you, then they're pressuring you. I feel pressure, I'm going to run. Is pressure always bad? If resisting or pushing back against something that makes us reconsider our ways, is that good sometimes? Maybe it's a fish belly experience. Maybe it's God's plan for us to feel that pressure because that pressure will push us and stretch us. So maybe instead of looking at things like an American consumer, we start looking at things of, you know, like, maybe as a believer in Christ. Maybe God's trying to show me something. Maybe God's trying to reveal something in my heart that doesn't belong, that he wants excised. And maybe instead of running, we lean in. Just like Jonah did. Hmm. So when God reveals to us that we have hurt him, Instead of running away or ignoring him, maybe we lean in. Maybe we put aside our assumptions that we all have, which is subconsciously that God is angry with us. That God is like, fine, you can come back to me, I guess, but you're going to go in the back seat. You know what I mean? Whereas in reality, his arms are always outstretched and tears are running down his face because he knows that we've settled for second best, but he still wants us back. He still loves us. Please, God, may that be our response. So how do you respond when God reveals to you that, that you've sinned against him? I hope it's humility. I hope you don't run away. I hope what you do is you run toward him. Secondly, the key word, overturn. Powerful truth. Overturn, as we heard, overturn means, yes, it does mean to overthrow. It does mean to destroy. But the nuance is that it, can have a, it has a double meaning. It can also mean transform and change. Yes, God could have completely annihilated all of the Ninevites. He could have overthrown them. But their sincere repentance led him to change and to transform them instead. I told you the story of the church that I was part of, the second full-time position in youth ministry. I was there for about six months, then I was asked to resign because it was not a fit. And it was a traumatic experience. And I remember the pain that Rebecca and I felt. Um, it was a, 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 just came out of the blue. I remember it was Palm Sunday, right around that time of the year and everything. And, and I remember in the meeting with the pastor, you know, uh, the pastor said, so you do understand that it would be very awkward if you came back at this point, right? his way of saying, don't come back. We were shunned, and uh, we didn't do anything wrong. I mean, it, there was no moral failure, but we felt like you know, we had you know, a whole church that turned their back on us. It was devastating and very painful, and so we were coming from that mindset. We needed, desperately needed love, and we needed support. My goodness, my youngest son was not even a year old. Aaron was not even a year old. 
And so the very next Sunday, we're going to go to church, right? So we go to this church plant. It's meeting at the YMCA, and I'll never forget that we were completely and totally ignored at this other church. This is one of the pet peeves I have. But I walked into this church, and I remember, literally, my eyes were up. Here we are, a family with four very young children, uh, four kids aged six and under, I believe. Is that right? Four kids. We walk in, don't know where anything is. Everybody's talking to their friends. Nobody's paying attention to us. So we just figure it out on our own. Uh, we walk down these winding hallways to get to the gymnasium where they had their services, and people are all lined up, you know, one-on-one, two-on-one, whatever, just kind of chit-chatting, whatever. Not one person even looked at us. We got all the way in the ministry center, the greeting time. I don't even know if anybody came over. Nobody came over during the greeting time to actually welcome us. Nobody did. We're sitting there. I'm stewing inside. I'm getting more and more angry. My perspective is, you know, what about me? What about us? You know, nobody cares about us. Went through the whole service. At the end, they said amen. People started to leave. Guess what? A repeat of the way in. We walked down the hallways. Literally, I'm staring into people's eyes. No one's looking up. We got all the way to the end, and we're ready to walk out the door to get to our car, and finally somebody looks up. It's the pastor. I unloaded on him. I just unloaded. I said, your church is garbage, basically. I said, in so many words, I just poured, it just seething anger just poured out of me. I just said, not one person even said hi to us. Nobody did. You know, I mean, you know, and I just unloaded. I kept going. And, uh, and I remember he said something that just hit me. This was, this was my, my fish belly experience. He said, he, I saw his face just change from a, a smile to just ashen. I mean, just he fell. You know, his face just fell. And after acknowledging, he said, we're working on it. We're aware of that. We need people that will step up and will help. We just don't have a lot of people like that. We're praying about that right now. This is in 2001, by the way. He said, but I, I feel checked in my spirit that God wants me to tell you that you have a critical spirit. And I didn't know what to say. I'm like, by that time, tears are filling my eyes. We just walked out, went over to the minivan, our minivan. We sat in there, and the kids seat belted in. Rebecca and I just sat in the front seats, and we wept. I was devastated, just blown away. I felt so much guilt and remorse that I just unloaded on this pastor, this church plant pastor, right before I planted my own church a year later. But anyway, and God spoke to me. And that fish belly experience for me led to a transformation in my mindset about the church as a whole. That experience transformed our perspective of what our role is in the church, what our role is to be in the church. Folks, the church is not designed and wasn't designed and wasn't provided to us by Jesus for us. The church is provided for us not to be served by, but to serve. The church is what we are designed in who we are designed to serve. We serve the church. We don't sit around, bring it, come on, come on, Meet my needs. Come on. Oh, sorry, your program's not good enough. I'm ditching you. We were provided, the church, by God as a gift, and we are all part of it, and we serve through the church. That's how God set it up. And my perspective changed from that day forward. I went back. We went back in, literally, to find where that pastor was. He wasn't there anymore, so he, what, I'm like, I hope I didn't really wound him too much. So I asked around. And, um, and I was able to find him right before he left. And we just wept. We just came to him and said, we were wrong. I am so sorry. And here's our story. And he said, I would love for you to come and be part of the solution because I know it's there. I'm doing the best that I can, but we're growing so fast that we can't manage all of this. And we need people to step up. And I said, I'll be that person. And we weren't even there very long. It was just a few more weeks. And then we ended up moving across the state and on our journey back to, uh, to, to ministry, but that was our fish belly experience. And my hope and my prayer is that in these days, as God is 
giving us those fish belly experiences, that we will look and we will say, God, what do you want to do through me? Because I know it's not to sit on the sidelines anymore and bellyache about things that are not happening that should be. God, are you calling me to step forward? Are you calling me to be part of the solution or not? God, are you trying to give me an experience to transform my mind, to transform my perspective of what my role is in your church that you've called me to be part of, or in my neighborhood that, you know, who, you know where I don't know any of my neighbors, or at my workplace where I've always kept to myself, and now you're calling me to step out on a limb and to look at these people, not as the enemy, but to look at these people instead as people that you love desperately, that you want to love through me. What is it, God, that you're calling me to do? God, please overturn my mindset. I want to close with two passages of scripture that make this point even more clear. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Write it down. You can read it on your own. But Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul writes to the Roman church. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need our minds to be renewed and to be transformed, don't we? Every moment of every day, God, transform my mind by renewing it, please. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just 20 pages ahead of that, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. I want a new mind. I want a new perspective. I want whatever God wants. Lord, help me to repent, not apologize. Help me to truly embrace repentance, God. And Lord, overturn my mind if you need to. God, do whatever you need to do. Transform me. Change me. Change my perspective. As we close, I want to ask you two questions, rhetorical, but I want you to answer them in your own mind. What is God asking you to repent from? What is God asking you to repent from? What is it in your life that doesn't belong? And the second question is, what does God want to overturn in your life? What does he want to overturn to change, to transform? Bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, you are the epitome of one who loves. You are our savior. We glorify you, Lord, today. I pray right now for this body of believers, Lord. We're not playing church. God, we are here to glorify you, not just in our own lives, not just through our decisions, but Lord, you want to glorify yourself through our obedience. You want to glorify yourself, Lord, as we say yes to you. Lord, you are calling all of us to be Jonah's, to go to, uh, to, to the world all around us and to love people the way that you do. And so God, would you please forgive us? Forgive us, Lord, for our sin. Forgive us, God, for being so insincere with our apologies or for justifying our sin by saying, well, we're only human and God's going to love us anyway. Lord, forgive us for the egregious sin that that is, for taking advantage of your grace, Lord, to not, for not understanding that grace whatsoever. And ultimately, Lord, for not loving you because it's all about relationships. It all comes down to relationships, God. And when we sin against you repeatedly again and again and we kind of flippantly respond, oh God, we don't love you. That is not love. Help us to repent, Jesus. Help us to turn from our sin, to trust you enough. And God, please change our hearts. Transform us, Lord. Overturn our own will. And may our will be your will. May your will be done within each of our hearts.